Voices and Events of 1953, presented by the Travelers Insurance Companies of Hartford and their 40,000 agents and brokers throughout America. By recording, by a latter-day miracle, compounded of spinning reels and vacuum tubes, we were able to bring back the voices, the sounds, and the music that wove the pattern of this year. Our guide on this journey, and one of the most distinguished historians of our times, is NBC correspondent Morgan Beatty. Mr. Beatty. For the beginning, let us go back to the city of Washington, to the steps of the Capitol building covered this day with a platform, a stage on which the curtain was about to rise. January 20, it was, a chilly, wind-battered day, made gay by the sun that splashed down on the mall and the thousand flags that seemed to fly from every rooftop in the city. It was noon or so when the big car rolled out of the driveway at the White House and turned up Pennsylvania Avenue toward the Capitol. President Truman and President-elect Eisenhower seated side by side for this brief instant of time. The one ready to perform his final official duty, the other moving toward his rendezvous with history. Slowly, the car moves up the avenue toward the Capitol Dome, glistening this day as though aware of its importance as the symbol of a republic that will survive all of us gathered here to mark an end and a beginning. It was precisely 12.32 when the climax came. Fred M. Vinson, Chief Justice of the United States, is waiting with the two open Bibles, the Washington Bible and the Eisenhower Family Bible. He stands straight and tall, waiting for the next president of the United States. The murmur of the crowd stills, so that suddenly you're aware of traffic noises half a mile or so away. General Eisenhower places his left hand on the Bibles, and the two men look deep into each other's eyes. You, Dwight D. Eisenhower, do solemnly swear. I, Dwight D. Eisenhower, do solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States, that I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States, and will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. David Eisenhower, 62, of Abilene, West Point, an army post from Texas to the Philippines, 34th President of the United States. Casablanca, Normandy Beach, all his yesterdays have led to this. He stands for a moment, bareheaded, facing the crowd. The solemn moment is past now, and the crowd roars to see the famous Eisenhower grin. Then a sudden impulse. He strides across the platform and embraces Mamie. Now, a handshake from the former president. There's Vice President Nixon shaking hands with him now. And like guests at a wedding, when the ceremony is over, everyone is talking at once. But there is one voice we have come to hear. And in a moment, it speaks out loud and clear. My fellow citizens, the world and we have passed the midway point of a century of continuing challenge. We sense with all our faculties that forces of good and evil are masked and armed and opposed, as rarely before in history. But, as in music or in drama, you can't sustain a high note forever. Already some on the fringes of the crowd are beginning to drift away. An appointment with a customer, a car to be washed, there's a new president and the rest can wait. For our own country, it has been a time of recurring trial. The peace we seek, then, is nothing less than the practice and the fulfillment of our whole faith among ourselves and in our dealings with others. 
It signifies more than the stilling of guns, easing the sorrow of war. It is a hope for the brave. This is the hope that beckons us onward in this century of trial. This is the work that awaits us all, to be done with bravery, with charity, and with prayer to Almighty God. My citizens, I thank you. And there was a parade, West Point cadets, Korean War veterans, there was an atomic artillery gun, unloaded, the Army was careful to point out, there was an Alaskan dog team, bands by the dozens, and three elephants. President Truman drove down to Union Station for the train to Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, St. Louis, and finally the big rambling old house of Independence. There was quite a crowd waiting at the station, a crowd that sensed this ending of an era. The former president was obviously surprised to see them. Stubborn as the rock-strewn plains of Missouri in a fight, he is strangely unprepared for this. The song started somewhere in the back of the station, low at first. Then it began to grow until it filled the huge room. Should old acquaintance be forgotten? Since time out of mind, the best way to say hail and farewell. Mr. Truman and Beth stand for a moment at the gates of the track. Pause here for a moment, Mr. Truman. This will be something to remember. This, something to take back with your files and your books and your memories. This then was the end, the end of an era that, for better or for worse, will leave its mark on all of us, on our thoughts, our dreams, our ways of going in and coming out. Hail and farewell. This is the end and the beginning. In a moment, we will continue with our resurrection of the voices and sounds that made history in 1953. First, a brief message from J. Doyle DeWitt, president of the Travelers Insurance Companies of Hartford. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The voices and events we are reviewing this evening reflect an unsettled world. In many ways, we could wish it were a better world. But its very imperfection is a challenge to work for its improvement. It is not given to all of us to utter the memorable words or participate in the dramatic events which are so exciting in the retelling. But our people in their quiet quest for security, for decency, and for freedom are doing as much as any headline maker to achieve the kind of world we all hope for. Many individuals have dedicated themselves to helping others in this quest. It is about one of these that I want to speak. I choose him primarily because he represents the business of insurance. But beyond that, I think the work he is doing in behalf of our way of life is worthy of special notice. He is not the type who makes headlines. I am speaking of your insurance agent. You know him as a friend and as an advisor. You have entrusted to his care the financial protection of your family, your business, and your possessions. He is shared in your planning for the future. You have learned to rely on his professional skill and judgment as you do on those of your doctor or your lawyer. You know he has your best interest at heart. During his career of service, your insurance agent has become an expert in his field. He combines his specialized training with broad practical experience. He is dedicated to the principle of being there when you need him, to answer a question, to solve a problem, to keep your insurance protection up to date, to advise you on changes in your program, and to assist you in the speedy settlement of any claim. Whatever company he represents, your insurance agent is an important individual in your life. He is part of the protection that goes with the policy. His many services are indispensable to the complete sense of security a good insurance program brings. 
In the face of life's uncertainties and hazards, he helps you build a strong wall of protection against loss. As an architect of security, he has few equals. You will find him a good citizen, a good friend, and a good man in an emergency. He will show you how you can shed much of the worry and fear which burden so many of us. National security is the sum of personal security, and our greatest strength lies in our ability to look ahead with certainty and to plan with confidence. In helping you plan for your future, your insurance agent is doing much to assure the future for all of us. We return to Voices and Events of 1953. It seemed to some of us that the cheers were still echoing along Pennsylvania Avenue when the first discordant notes began to creep in to the west, to the lands that sloped down to the Mississippi and beyond. Men began to look to the skies for the rain that did not come. Late winter turned to spring, seed time to midsummer, and still the sun burned down unshielded by the clouds that should be rolling in from the west. Corn shriveled on the stalks. Wheat turned brown before it was a foot high. Cattle fought for the damp mud where streams used to flow. Farm prices went down. The word parity was heard more and more. And the name of Ezra Taft Benson, Eisenhower's new Secretary of Agriculture. Kentucky, one of the nation's worst drought sufferers, has had no rain in from 31 to 60 days. Record-breaking temperatures are running 20 degrees above seasonal normals. And pasture conditions are only 37... In this great dairy section of Wisconsin, where there are five times as many cows as people, the farmer has little confidence in Agriculture Secretary Ezra Benson. Typical of the reaction are the comments... The owners of the great wheat fields of North and South Dakota are traditionally conservative Republicans. But like anyone else, when they feel the squeeze where it hurts in their pocketbooks, they look for a scapegoat. Many an upper Midwest farmer honestly feels Secretary Benson is responsible for sagging. Secretary Benson's policies are a red-hot issue here in the heart of the Corn Belt. Harvest field reaction ranges all the way from heated demands for the Secretary's immediate dismissal to quiet praise for his farm self-help program and his ideals. It's obvious that many farmers caught in the price-cost squeeze are asking for less piety and more parity. One day, a strange caravan rolls into Washington. Buses filled with farm and cattle men come to present their complaints to the Secretary of Agriculture. They gathered in the auditorium of the Department of Agriculture, delivered speeches asking for a price support for cattle. Then, listen, as Benson faced them on the platform, faced, to one of the toughest moments of his career. We tried it on hogs in 1943, wasn't it, Harry? 1943. It resulted in a dismal failure. It seems to me that this indirect approach is the most practical and the most feasible. Prices do show evidence of stabilizing and strengthening. And it's our feeling, based on the economic facts, and I'm not just saying this to make you happy today, because if the prospects for the future were dark, I'd say so to you. But I believe there's real encouragement that prices are expected to stabilize and possibly show some improvement, particularly for certain grades of cattle in the months ahead. For one farmer, at least, response was quick. Mr. Secretary, if that is all the outlook we have, God help the livestock industry. Not all problems were as serious. Consider, for example, the case of one Republican worker from the hills of Kentucky. When he read that the Eisenhower folks had won the election, he dropped a line to his congressman with a little request. For years, I've did everything you told me to do. For years, I've worked my head off for you and the GOP. And now, I want to ask you something. It's my time to ask you something. Now, I was reading in the paper that one that comes up from Louisville, about to the vacancy at a place they call the Court of St. James. And I want you to know I hereby want that job. <laughs> so John wrote him and, and told him, now, uh, dear Bill, I got your letter and I certainly appreciate all the things that you've done for me and for the party in Kentucky. You carried your precincts as you said you would and you did a fine job. I've been thinking over that matter about the Court of St. James over in London. It's a long way off, I'll tell you that. 
I understand that the missus is kind of down in the back, and it's bad climate over there, foggy and rainy, and I don't think it would agree with her. Furthermore, those people over there talk English, yeah, but with a funny kind of an accent, and I don't know that she'd get along very well with them. Let me know what you think about it after reading this letter. Another letter. Dear John, I got your letter. Everything you say is right. Now you make me assistant postmaster a dog holler, and we'll call this correspondence prose. As with sunlight and shadow, the dark oft times comes just when we think the sun will never stop its shining. Senator Robert Taft of Ohio, ready now as in the past to advise, to warn, to speak his mind, be the words soft to hear or stern. His colleagues in the Senate were the first to notice. A slowing of his walk, an involuntary hand to his hip where the pain seemed to stab like an enemy's sword. It was the president who told us that the end was not far off. There was a telegram came from the east that said that Senator Taft had announced that his physical condition has become so serious that he has had to give up his active duties as the leader of the Republican Party in the Senate. I am sure that you would allow me to speak for you. Indeed, I've already ventured to do so, I think, in a telegram I just sent, saying that we well knew that we could not spare such patriotic and devoted service as his and sent him our prayers for his early recovery. The end came at New York Hospital, July the 21st. His voice, they say, was strong until the end, a voice that surely only death could still. Let us arm ourselves. Let us make there's one thing that will deter Russia from war, and that is a strong American uh, uh, air force, a strong American uh, supply of atomic bombs. That's the only thing that uh, is going to deter Russia from an aggressive war. choice of many of his party for the presidency. But like Webster, Calhoun, Clay, this ultimate tribute was not for him. But there was glory enough and pride. Stern and unyielding as the rocks that push back the sea, he had the faith of a pilgrim father and a faith in his country that time and war and disappointment could never shake. He became a symbol of all men who stand upon their feet and speak their minds, say, this I like, this I do not like. Perhaps that's what many had in mind when they made their pilgrimage to the Capitol building, to the coffin that lay flag draped and guarded, to pay their last respects to one whose wisdom and counsel will be missed in the times that lie ahead. Robert Alfonso Taft, 1889-1953. And the year rolled on. The wire machines of the great news agencies, like some mechanical Greek chorus, tried to clarify the story. A calculating machine in the Bureau of Census in Washington recorded that the 160 millionth American citizen had just been born. In Denver, Colorado, a man named Max Michael Schneckenjaker went to court to have his name shortened. He dropped the Michael. In Arkansas, a legislator proposed a $750 annual tax on bachelors. The proposal was referred to the Committee on Conservation of Natural Resources. In Wilmington, North Carolina, a police sergeant put his feet up on the desk for a moment to read a report. When he stood up, he noticed that some crook had stolen his shoes. Some datelines come up more than others, and one voice, at least, was heard more often as the year wore on. Let me answer this question. Uh, you testified that uh, 
You felt our cause in South Korea was unjust. Do you feel the cause of the Chinese communists and the North Koreans is a just cause? Exactly as just as it would be for us to invade feel, Mexico or Canada if they had come into those countries as we came into do South you feel, Korea. Do you feel that the cause of the Chinese communists is a just cause? Joseph R. McCarthy, oh, junior senator like from Wisconsin. Where we are now he leans back in the chair, seemingly relaxed. Only the dark, penetrating eyes betray his tense alertness. Do you feel that the Russian communist system is superior to our system? I will reply that I must refuse to answer under the Fifth Amendment, which protects me against self-incrimination. I refuse to answer on the grounds that my answer might tend to incriminate me. It became a refrain, like some piece of Wagnerian identification music in an opera that seemed to have no end. The charge and the countercharge, communism in the churches, the voice of America, NATO shipping that touched at the ancient ports of Hangzhou and Suzhou with oil for the lamps of China, oil and rubber and steel, or at least so went the story. And the role of Senator McCarthy, to some, he is a shining knight fighting an almost single-handed war against communist infiltration. The raw harsh, unpleasant fact is that communism is an issue and will be an issue in 1954. To others, he is a shallow demigod, cloaking his personal ambition behind a false issue in the manner soiled by half-truths and decked with innuendos. The picture is not yet clear. The sure, issues, uh, like the okay. voices, are I'm still confused. I'm not at all I'm sure, and I'd like to have uh, an answer. If you've been there, if you're going to be a great authority on Russia, I'd like to talk clear. to somebody who's been there. And the story is not yet ended. But one chapter, at least, was closed. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, convicted of conspiracy to deliver atomic secrets to Russia. And on the evening of June the 19th, just as the setting sun was signaling the beginning of the Jewish Sabbath, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, traitors alike to their country and their God, paid with their lives for a crime whose hugeness beggars the imagination. That same week, seven Hawaiian communist leaders were convicted in Honolulu of conspiring to teach and advocate violent overthrow of the government. A 36% increase in parcel post rates was announced. France was entering its sixth week without a cabinet. And... We were hearing for the last time a once familiar voice. The first Noel, the angel did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay, in fields where they lay, keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep. Mark it well. As a young woman, she charmed a generation. And still we can catch, I think, Something of the elfish, that was the word they always used, the elfish unworldliness that, like some gentle magnet year after year, drew our fathers into the top balcony to watch and listen. Maud Adams, born Maud Kiscadden. It seems unkind to mention how long ago, 1872 it was, in the frontier city of Salt Lake. It was as Peter Pan... In the whimsical play of James M. Barry, that she reached her greatest heights. As the shadows began to fall, one wonders if she remembered that line, the final line of Act Three that she had spoken so often. Peter Pan, trapped on a rock in a swiftly rising tide, stares at the water and says, To die will be an awfully big adventure. For Maud Adams, on July 17th, on a farm in upstate New York, the big adventure. Whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. It 
was half a world away and then some. But to most of us, it was like some gay parade had come down our street and stopped before our door. The coronation of a queen. A queen as lovely and gracious as any in the fairy stories they used to write when the world was young. London was bedecked like some old warrior who, with medals of shine, stepped forth for a final review. The old city had seen many a celebration, but surely none like this. Flags crowding down on Hyde Park. Uniforms from every distant corner of the empire. And music to beguile us into thinking for a while, at least, that the business of the world is a gay and lilting thing. And all must end happily ever after. easily forget that rain-splattered day when I sat in the old abbey and watched the queen emerge from the little side door and walk slowly, ever so slowly, and how like a queen, to the high chair of Edward the Confessor, there to take, in the manner of all the shadowy earlier ones, the crown of empire. Winston Churchill, uh, Sir Winston, we must remember to call him, to begin the final act, to introduce the new queen to the millions of Britons who, sick for home, listened in across the world. Perhaps we in this country can take the liberties of old neighbors and point out that Sir Winston was not as young as we've seen him in other times, but he performed this duty as he has all the others. It may be our imagination, beguiled by affection, but... It seemed that at the very end, the emotion becomes too great and that tremendous voice fails for just a moment. Perhaps not. Listen and judge for yourself. We have had a day which the oldest are proud to have lived to see and which the youngest will remember all their lives. It is my duty and my honor to lead you to its culmination. The splendor of this 2nd of June glow in our minds. Now, as night falls, you will hear the voice of our sovereign herself, crowned in our history and enthroned forever in our hearts. The Queen. When I spoke to you last at Christmas, I asked you all, whatever your religion, to pray for me on the day of my coronation. 
to pray that God would give me wisdom and strength to carry out the promises that I should then be making. Throughout this memorable day, I have been uplifted and sustained by the knowledge that your thoughts and prayers were with me. As this day draws to its close, I know that my abiding memory of it will be the inspiration of your loyalty and affection. I thank you all from a full heart. God bless you all. Listening to Voices and Events of 1953, the transcribed record of this year, presented by the Travelers Insurance Companies of Hartford and their 40,000 agents and brokers throughout America. We now pause 10 seconds for station identification. The year was no longer young. The whistles and bells we used to greet that first midnight had long since been thrown away. The year, like a day that stretches toward the noon, had lost its freshness. Still, the seasons kept their appointed rounds, and March came in with its hint of spring. March 4th. In New York, there were advance advertisements for the circus that would come before long to Madison Square Garden. Early roses were blooming in Atlanta. Snow beat down on the Rockies. And half a world away, another snow filtered down on that most forbidding spot of all the world. The huge yard inside the walls of the Kremlin. News comes reluctantly out of Moscow, but there are some things that all the propaganda ministers in the world cannot hide. A sleepy monitoring clerk for the British Broadcasting Corporation, tuning in early in the morning on March the 4th, was the first to hear. This is Radio Moscow. The Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and the Council of Ministers of the USSR announced the misfortune that has befallen our party and our people, the grave illness of Comrade Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin. On the night of March the 1st, while in his apartment in Moscow, Comrade Stalin was afflicted by a hemorrhage of the brain, which affected the vital life centers of the brain. Comrade Stalin lost consciousness. The next night, another broadcast said that Stalin was still alive, but that his condition had grown worse with heart and lung complications developing. 4.07 in the morning, March the 6th. This time, thousands were listening in as Radio Moscow again came on the air with its broadcast to the West. The Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, with profound grief, informed the party and all the people of the Soviet Union now on March the 5th, at 9.50 in the evening, Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin passed away after a severe illness. The, heart of the, the crowds began to form, they told us later, long before the dawn touched the Kremlin walls. Women mostly, but men too, huddled together against the wind that rolled down from the level plains of Siberia. The city gave itself to grief. (laughs) 
Soviet Premier Joseph Vissaronovich Stalin, revolutionary, ex-convict, would-be priest but worshipper of darkness, supreme ruler over hundreds of millions who knew him only as a rarely heard voice or a face staring down from a factory wall. Red Square is packed with 50,000 persons as the coffin is carried across the long pavement into the Lenin Mausoleum. This, then, was the final scene for the cobbler's son of the village of Gori in Georgia, Joseph Stalin, born Joseph Jugashvili, child of Marx and Lenin, father of misery and grief beyond reckoning. Play the music louder, you musicians, and strike the bell harder, you with the weeping eyes. It tolls for thee. Then, a surprise to all not wise to the ways of tyrants, Lavrenti Beria, once leader of the secret police, was executed as a traitor. And there were other troubles. Rumblings of an ancient hate coming from the drear and dismal lands of the north. There were voices that would not be stilled and music with forbidden words. In the slave labor camps of the Soviet Union, there is so little time. Before the sun rises in the morning, the prisoners are summoned from their huts, herded together and marched off to the mines, the forests, or the fields. There they labor all the long day without pause, toil to meet the exacting quotas which have been set as each man's price for survival. Perhaps the strangest thing about these songs from the slave labor camps of the Soviet Union is that they are sung at all. <laughs> On the 17th day of June, in the Russian sector of the city of Berlin, the impossible happened. Revolt. Open, armed, revolt. The underground whispered the story. Workers out at Brandenburg, fighting at Magdeburg and Leipzig. Strikers live lit Soviet police in the uranium mines of Saxony. Observers in the West listened, while one who had joined in the riots told of that morning when it all began. It was an uprising. Everyone had been awaiting years for that moment, and they all left their factories and offices and poured into the streets. I was talking to workers from other places in eastern Germany, and they all said the same thing. It was not a strike, but an uprising. It was over, or practically so, in a few days. In East Berlin, at least. But the big fight, the one for the money, was still going on. For three years and then some, you could hear the rumbling rolling down the valleys of Korea. The peace talks had dragged on interminably till you thought peace would never come. Then, the morning of July 27th, at Panmunjom, delegations from the two sides met for the final ceremony that would end it all. This is John Rich speaking to you from Panmunjom. The ceremony of the signing of the Korean armistice document is just getting underway here in the Peace Pagoda. In the center of the huge room are three tables covered with green felt. Two of them about the size of pool tables, and there's a smaller one in the center for the document. Lieutenant General William Harrison has just come in. He's seated alone at one table facing us. At the other table is General Namio the North Korean chief delegate. General Ma Kwas was scheduled to sign at his advanced headquarters in Munsan just three hours from now. In just 12 hours, all the shooting will be over. And the news went out across the world. Cease fires. At headquarters behind the lines, it came as a radio message. And the order passed down the lines to the men on the shells guard hills. Hills that crawl like some prehistoric monster across the land. For this nation, the cost of repelling aggression has been high. In thousands of homes, it has been incalculable. 
that has been paid in terms of tragedy. With special feelings of sorrow and of solemn gratitude, we think of those who were called upon to lay down their lives in that far off land to prove once again that only courage and sacrifice can keep freedom alive upon the earth. The next big job was to bring back those prisoners who still remained in enemy camps. One man, well, we've seen his like before. He was, I'm sure, at Valley Forge, the only enlisted man in Washington's army with two pairs of fur-lined boots. He was at Gettysburg. Remember the man who bribed the farmer's wife into making hot biscuits just before Longstreet's big attack? This fellow provided the shortening, and from somewhere, a pound of butter and a jar of honey... And, of course, he was in Korea. He was taken prisoner, but even the Reds couldn't restrain his ingenuity. They wouldn't give us any whiskey or nothing, so we decided to make our own. And we hollowed out logs and made our containers for our whiskey. We had a couple of blowouts. And finally, one day, misfortunately, they, uh, they uh, was checking air raid shelter to store food. And they found our crocs. <laughs> So they threw me in the clink for it. How long were you in the clink, Joe? Uh, three days. And then they'd come over and told me if I wouldn't make it again, they'd let me out. But if I made it again, they'd, they'd double or triple my sentence and make, and make it a lot harder on me. So you, you kind of gave up your distilling business? Oh, not quite. Made it a smaller bottle. In most capitals, the end of the war was looked on as the beginning of a time of peace. But we wondered how the fighting man felt about it. One who had looked into the eyes of the enemy and knew the sound of his voice. We found such a man. Found him one evening in a bivouac area, not far from what had been the MLR, the main line of resistance. An outdoor chapel service was just ending, and in a few moments it would be dark. How go with him the ways of peace? Well, a lot of people say the war is over. I'm not so sure it is. But I've been here about 16 and a half months now, and I'm ready to go home. But there's a lot more where I came from. Somebody can come over and take my place. And I think a lot of somebodies are going to have to come over here and stay for a while. I don't think we can trust the commies as far as I can throw this building. And the Earth kept its appointments among the stars. Scientists at the Wilson Observatory reported that the universe was expanding. The Russian radio announced that a Soviet astronomer had discovered plant life on Mars. Alfred Kinsey published his long-awaited book on the American female. But after a big initial sale, the book didn't do much better than a reprint from the Bobsy Twins at Meadowbrook Farm. A radio comedian publicly fired one of his singers and a young actor and writer turned a few bars of music into a national institution. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, December 24th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Bernard. My name's Friday. Jack Webb, working with his partner out of homicide, but definitely not out of ideas. Dragnet, you... My job. Slam. Back a few years in time and a few thousand miles in space to Paris. A French composer named Georges Auric wrote a little piece called It's April Again. It's April again and the lovers are lining the bed. It was greeted in the music world with about as much enthusiasm as rust on a slide trombone. But somehow, the music came to the desk of one Julie Stearns, who was looking for a song for the movie Moulin Rouge. He bought it, new lyrics were added, 
Percy Faith cut it down from 38 bars to the usual 32, and an old song came out in new dress, the top song of 1953, the song from Moulin Rouge. And now, once again, J. Doyle DeWitt, president of the Travelers Insurance Companies of Hartford. It is a source of great personal satisfaction for me to realize that in every corner of the land where my voice is being heard, some member of the Travelers family is close at hand. In terms of numbers, we are a big family comprising more than 14,000 employees and 40,000 agents and brokers. In terms of service rendered, we are still bigger. Millions of Americans who own travelers' policies are the special concern of our family members, and during this past year, they have done their jobs faithfully and well. To our agents and brokers, our safety engineers, our claim men, our service personnel, both at home and in the field, may I say this. We measure our success in terms of human values. And everything you have done has been directed towards the conservation and the preservation of the greatest of these values, families, homes, businesses, and property. This is a proud record, and I am grateful to you. And now, to everyone listening, on behalf of the Traveler's family, may I wish you a very happy New Year. We return to Voices and Events of 1953. On the night of October the 15th, a new play opened at the Martin Beck Theater, just off Broadway. It had a strange title, The Tea House of the August Moon, written by John Patrick. Something about Okinawa, the judge from the advanced publicity. More than one of us had our doubts. Doubts that were expelled forever when David Wayne stepped before the footlights and spoke the opening lines. Lovely ladies, kind gentlemen, pleased to introduce myself. Sakini by name, interpreter by profession, education by ancient dictionary, Okinawan by whim of gods. History of Okinawa revealed distinguished record of conquerors. We have honored to be subjugated in 14th century by Chinese pirates, in 16th century by English missionaries, in 18th century by Japanese warlords, and in 20th century by American Marines. Okinawa have a very fortunate culture brought to us, not have to leave home for it. I learned many things. Most important, that rest of the world not like Okinawa. World filled with delightful variation. Illustration. In Okinawa, no locks on doors. Bad manners not to trust neighbors. In America, lock and key big industry. Conclusion. Bad manners, good business. But all Kanawans most eager to be educated by conquerors. Deep desire to improve fiction. Not easy to learn, sometimes painful. But pain makes man think. Thought makes man wise. Wisdom makes life endurable. So, we tell a little story to demonstrate splendid example of benevolent assimilation of democracy by Okinawa.
And so we come almost to year's end. The colors of autumn had turned to wintry brown. When suddenly... Harry Dexter White was a Russian spy. He smuggled secret documents to Russian agents for transmission to Moscow. Harry Dexter White was known to be a communist spy by the very people who appointed him to the most sensitive, important position he ever held in government service. Herbert Brownell, Attorney General of the United States. He was speaking at a club in Chicago, but his words were heard across the country, heard in Independence, Missouri. Herbert Brownell, Jr., the Attorney General of the United States, the highest legal officer in our government, has degraded the highest function of government, the administration of justice. And in saying, Harry Dexter White was known to be a communist spy by the very people who appointed him, he lied to the American people. It is now evident that the present administration has fully embraced for political advantage, McCarthyism. And another voice was added. Now, the other night, Truman defined what he called was McCarthyism. The definition was identical, word for word, comma for comma, with the definition adopted by the communist daily worker, which originated the term McCarthyism. Now, let's take a look at the Republican Party. Unfortunately, in some cases, our batting average has not been too good. Are we going to continue to send perfume notes following the style of the Truman-Atchison regime? And what began as an attack on the Truman administration developed into a strictly Republican family fight. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles. Since I uh, met with you last week, there has been a widely publicized uh, criticism of this administration's foreign policy. The burden of that criticism was that we spoke too kindly to our allies and sent them so-called perfumed uh, notes instead of using threats and intimidation to compel them to do our bidding. I welcome constructive criticism, but the criticism I refer to attacks the very heart of United States foreign policy. And so the circle is almost joined. A few days and a few hours, and the Earth will have completed its giant swing around the sun. A few days and a few hours, and each of us will, after his own fashion, greet another year. But time still for a last look behind. How can we sum up this year just done, this 12 months out of our allotted time, this year of grace, 1953? If there is any one hope or dream or vision that shines before us all, it is, I think, a hope for peace for ourselves and all the peoples of the earth. If the peoples of the world are to conduct an intelligent search for peace, they must be armed with the significant facts of today's existence. Dwight David Eisenhower stands before the Congress of the World. He comes in his office as President of the United States, but his voice is the voice of all, the nameless and the uncounted, the weary and the troubled, the peace-hungry men of goodwill across the world. Let no one think that the expenditure of vast sums for weapons and systems of defense can guarantee absolute safety for the cities and citizens of any nation. The United States, heeding the suggestion of the General Assembly of the United Nations, is instantly prepared to meet privately with such other countries as may be principally involved to seek an acceptable solution to the atomic armaments race which overshadows not only the peace but the very life of the world. The United States does not wish merely to present strength but also the desire and the hope for peace. The hope for peace. This is our heritage from the past. This, our solemn compact with tomorrow. Almost 90 years ago, Abraham Lincoln, at the end of a war, delivered his second inaugural address. At the end of that speech, he spoke some words that I think more nearly 
would express the true feelings of America tonight than would any other words ever spoken or written. You recall them with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. This is our resolve and our dedication. Voices and Events of 1953 was written and directed by William Allen Bales, produced by Chet Hagen and Joe Myers, and brought to you by the Travelers Insurance Companies of Hartford and their 40,000 agents and brokers throughout America. Henry Eustace was the tape editing engineer. <laughs>